Welcome to lecture number three of advanced power plant design in the spring 2014 semester. This is uh, Nicholas Seifert, the instructor. And uh, in this lecture, I'm going to be talking about exergy and exergy destruction. So this is um, normally not covered in undergraduate thermodynamics, though I do want to point out that um, if you have the standard textbook from thermodynamics textbooks for mechanical engineers is Moran and Shapiro and they do have a chapter devoted to exergy so it's not an unconventional topic it just isn't always covered uh, the reason I'm covering it is that um, there's often confusion between the what we say the energy in a substance and its actual exergy where exergy as we'll find out is its capability to do work so let me give the, the formal definition of exergy and then we'll, we'll start uh, working from here. Formal definition is, is that exergy is defined as the amount of work obtainable when a system is brought from its initial state to a state of thermodynamic equilibrium with the common substances of the natural environment by means of a process that generates no entropy. So what this is saying is that exergy is a property of a substance and its environment. So you need to specify the composition, the pressure, and the temperature of the system, as well as the composition, the pressure, and the temperature of the environment, where the environment has got to be some kind of much, much, much larger in scale than the system itself, meaning the environment is some kind of like dead state, I guess you is one way of describing it. So here on Earth, the we have we're surrounded by such a large volume of nitrogen and oxygen and water vapor and small amount of carbon dioxide at um, at a certain temperature pressure, which is almost the same across where we're going to be building these where we're going to be building power plants such that we're going to be using an equilibrium state of one atmosphere, 300 Kelvin, and a chemical composition of 78% um, nitrogen on, on, a, on a dry basis, 78% um, nitrogen, 20% oxygen, 2% water vapor, if you're including the water vapor, and 400 ppm of carbon dioxide. Um, so that's and that is the equilibrium state and then any other system whether it's compressed oxygen compressed air hydrogen compressed hydrogen compressed methane all those states are different than the environment and one way of thinking about what the exergy is it's it's how different you are from the environmental state so if if you have compressed air, the only th thing that makes it different than the environment is that it's compressed. Or if you have hot, um, if you have hot air, right? The only thing that makes a difference is the temperature. When you have hot compressed air, you know now we have a couple things, and now we're, you know we can start getting farther and farther from the equilibrium state. When we have hydrogen, right? Hydrogen gas looks nothing like the environment and it is the degree to which it is different than the environment that there is exergy so the way to think I mean so exergy of a system can only be zero if it looks exactly like the environment or positive if it, it does not look like the environment and what happens is the system will tend over time a non-equilibrium state will tend to evolve towards the equilibrium state. So if you had a container with hydrogen in it, slowly over time, the hydrogen would combine with oxygen and form water vapor and then reach a composition of water vapor in the atmosphere um, such that it was nearly the same composition as, um, as in the environment as it is right now, which is about 2% on average. Now, of course, the where you are 
depends. Uh, your, your environmental temperature um, and hence composition, because the composition is going to be affected by the amount of water vapor in there, are change depending on where you are in the globe, the time of year, you know, the time of day, right? They're constantly changing. But in this class, we're going to be keeping it as a constant because it doesn't change that much compared to the temperatures at which most processes take place in the power plant. You know, compared to the temperatures in combustors, com temperatures in high uh, temperature heat exchangers, those changes have virtually no effect. Now, with that having been said, the, some of the stuff um, some of the calculations around cooling water towers are going to be greatly affected by the time of day, where you are located, um, and where you're located depends has the effect of um, how much water vapor there is. All of these can affect cooling water calculations, but they have virtually no effect on calculations taking place inside the combustion chamber. So let me just go through a little bit more what I mean by exergy, and we're going to see how exergy can be destroyed. So I'm showing here um, a graph in which you had some kind of high temperature energy source, and uh, then you have a, a heat exchanger, some kind of metal that's separating a high temperature from a low temperature. And what we have is energy being transported through that heat exchanger as vibrational modes in, in, the, in the lattice of the metal. So phonons are being transported from one side to the other. And um, those phonons carry with them energy, exergy, and entropy. So on the high temperature side, they carry a certain amount of energy. And because it's at a high temperature, that energy has a lot of exergy. But when you get to the low temperature side, if that low temperature side is close to room temperature, then there's virtually no exergy left in the phonons. So the phonons are still carrying the same amount of energy, but there's no exergy left. So what's happening here is that the entropy is being generated. So what we had on the high temperature side might have been a few phonons of high energy, but by by the low temperature side, on the left here on this graph, we have a lot of phonons, all of which um, have small amounts of energy. So in that analogy that I've been using of coins, so on the right side, we might have one silver dollar that's carrying, um, we might have like silver dollars carrying the energy, and then by the time it gets to the low temperature side, it's all pennies. and the so we have a bunch of pennies compared to, well, let's say, one silver dollar. So the entropy, i.e. the number of coins, increased. And the, uh, the temperature here being the ratio of the energy to number of coins, or the money to coins. So what's happening is that we have a generation of coins in this analogy, which here is the generation of entropy. And as you irreversibly generate this entropy by the creation of these coins from let's say pennies from silver dollars, you, you are destroying exergy. And it, what is happening is that if your reference environment is all pennies, you can't do any work because everything, if everything looks like pennies. You're, you have the capability of doing work when you have silver dollars floating around in a sea of pennies is the way to think about it because the silver dollars look significantly different than the pennies. That's one way we can think about it. But as the pe if the silver dollars are just left to themselves, they will eventually irreversibly turn into pennies. And once they're pennies, there is no um, way of uh, getting any work out from the system. So this is the kind of the way I like thinking about it is in this analogy of the coins. So the exergy of the system deviates the more it deviates from the environmental pressure, temperature, voltage, and chemical composition. The exergy of the universe can only, only decrease, meaning exergy can only be de destroyed, it can't be created. So there was a certain amount of exergy, meaning 
almost at the beginning of time, almost everything was really, really high, you know, silver, silver dollars. And slowly over time, things are turning from silver dollars into quarters, quarters into nickels, and nickels into pennies. Um, but as long as there's a lower, some lower denominated in coin, you can continue to keep on just turning pennies into, you know, half pennies, half pennies and a quarter penny. So I'm not, I'm just telling you that the trend over time is to go from these higher value ones to lower value ones. But as long as there is no lowest denominator coin, then this can continue to go on for quite a long time. Okay. So, as a reminder, the exergy is a function not only of the pressure, temperature, and chemical composition of the substance, but it's also a function of that reference pressure, temperature, and chemical composition. Okay, um, I put up here just for your reference um, what the exergy of a control volume is. So I'm using a big E here. So things that contribute to the exergy are things like kinetic energy. So if I say the um, if my control volume is surrounding a book and I throw that book and it has some kinetic energy, that kinetic energy of the book contributes to its exergy. And you can see that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the kinetic energy and the exergy. Meaning you can convert kinetic energy 100% into work. So if I throw a ball, the uh, mv squared kinetic energy of that ball can be 100% convert converted into electrical work or gravitational work or any, any uh, mechanical work. Okay. So other sources of exergy are potential energy. So this means gravitational potential energy can be converted into um, mechanical or electrical energy. And the way to think about uh, these last two ones is that there's only one um, for a given mass, there's only one variable you need to describe its kinetic energy, and that's its velocity. There's also only one variable you need to describe its gravitational potential once you know its mass, and that's its height. So there's only one information, and the log of one is zero, which means there's no entropy associated with that energy, i.e., that it's a pure form of work is the way to think about it. Other forms of work don't necessarily have a one-to-one -one correspondence. And that's why you see with these other terms here, like the there's the internal energies and the uh, entropies, the internal energy does not get, cr um, there's not a direct correspondence that say, because we have a U minus TS term here. So if you have thermal energy, there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence with exergy. You actually get something like a Carnot efficiency that's going to show up because you have a U minus TS term. So we're not going to be using this equation, but I, I wanted to point out the things that go into the exergy. I want to point out that the exergy kind of looks like when you get rid of the uh, kinetic energy and potential energy, it looks kind of like the Gibbs free energy, a U plus PV minus TS. And uh, the reason for that is that um, the environment, we're, we're, we're specifying its temperature and pressure, which is why it's going to show up as a, something like the Gibbs free energy. So we're not going to use this equation, but I want to point out that there is a definition for the big E. Now we're not going to be using big E because we're going to be using the steady state approximation. So what we're going to be using is molar flow exergy because we're going to have to calculate the exergy flowing into and out of a control volume. So the molar flow exergy is going to be a function of the temperature and pressure of the substance as well as the temperature and pressure of the environment. And it looks like, the I mean the the molar flow exergy is equal to the molar enthalpy minus the molar enthalpy of the environment minus the temperature of the environment times the quantity the molar entropy minus the molar entropy of the environment. 
for an ideal gas and constant specific heat, the first term, the change in enthalpy one looks like CCP times the quantity T minus T naught. The uh, entropy term looks like CCP times the logarithm of T over T naught minus R times the log of P over P naught. Now what I want to point out here, so the T, T's and P's are the pressure of the substance and temperature. The T naught and P naught are the of the are the the T naught is the temperature of the environment. The P naught, and that's the interesting here, the P naught here is the pressure of the species in the reference environment. So if we are if we have um, carbon di carbon dioxide flowing into a control volume at one atmosphere is one atmosphere, P naught is 400 ppm of an atmosphere. So 4 times 10 to the minus 4 of an atmosphere. So I just want to point that out here in this equation. The P naught is the pressure of the species in the reference environment. So if we have oxygen flowing into a control volume at one atmosphere, then what we have in this equation the P is one atmosphere and P naught is 0.2 atmospheres. So let's look at in that um, in the equation there was a term there are terms that have temperature and there was a there was one term that had pressure. So let me show you what the term that has temperature looks like. And this is what I mean by as far as temperature goes, the exergy can only be greater than or equal to zero. So and that's what this, uh, this equation looks like. You can see that it's zero at 300 Kelvin. And as you go below or above it, the exergy is greater than zero. So if I have a cryogenic system at 10 Kelvin, it has the same exergy, at nearly the same exergy as a system about at 2000 Kelvin. Right? So cold Something that something is cold looks very much different than the environment. And because it looks different than the environment, it has exergy. And you could actually use that substance to, to run a steam cycle and generate electricity, or, which is work. So you can do work if you have a substance that's cold compared to the environment. The other way to think about it is it takes work to make something cold, right? It actually takes work to make something look different than the environment. If you want to heat it up compared to the environment, it takes work. If you want to cool it off compared to the environment, it takes work. The only thing that doesn't take work is to make something that is the environment look like, stay like the environment. Uh, I want to point out for uh, the flow exergy, if you have a gas mixture, then uh, the exergy term has got to be corrected for the molar composition. And once again, make sure that in the equation um, the, where it's the minus r log of p over p naught, make sure in the numerator you, you are using the partial pressure of species i in the gas mixture and then divided by the partial pressure of species I in the environment. So let's use an uh, example here. If we had a 50-50 mixture of air, so, well, 50-50 mixture of nitrogen and oxygen flowing into a control volume, and the total pressure were two atmospheres, of a 50-50 mixture flowing into a control volume. Then in the term, then of course the mole fraction in this equation is going to be 50% for each of the species. In the, um, for the oxygen term, when you're calculating minus r log of p over p, you'd have minus r times the logarithm of, in the numerator, you'd have 2 times 50%, and then you'd be dividing that by 20, 21%. For the nitrogen term, 
you'd have minus r times the logarithm of 2, the total pressure, times 50%, divided by um, 0.78. Right? So I just want to point out here um, that um, it's that partial pressure of the species that's going to be sh in, in that gas that's going to be showing up in the, um, the entropy term. So I want to, so what I have here is the extra G we're going to be using for real gas non -sp constant specific heat and th this will be used uh, throughout the cap course for all species except for steam. Uh, steam will be using a macro and uh, for that macro you're going to need to do an H minus H H naught minus T naught times S minus S naught where um, the knots are for temperature of 300 Kelvin and a partial pressure of 0 0.02 atmospheres, i.e. 2% of an atmosphere, which is what we're going to be using in this course as the reference pressure for water vapor. Actual composition of water vapor can vary from about 0 to 4% out there on, on Earth. But we're, so we're going to be using an average value of 2% of an atmosphere. So if you see for this equation, if you have a gas mixture, you're going to have to be doing a summation over the terms. And then you're going to have temperature um, as T deviates from T naught. You're going to be getting exergy. You're going to get exergy as the pressure is, varies from the pressure of the environment. And you're also going to have this correction term to account for the real gas nature. And um, I've shown this equation both when you leave it as B2V or when you plug in the um, um, B minus the B's, B, B primes and A primes into the equation above. So now uh, we're going to be looking at how we derive the exergy balance, exergy balance equation. So what you do is you, um, here's a summary of the, f the first law of thermodynamics and the second law of thermodynamics for open systems. So to get to the exergy balance, we're going to take the first law and then we're going to subtract T naught times the second law. And we're going to be coming up with an exergy balance equation. So the exergy balance equation is shown. It's the, the change in the exergy of a control volume with respect to time is equal to the summation over all species I flowing into or out of the system of the molar flow rate of I where here plus means into the system and n dot would be negative if it's leaving the system times the molar flow rate of species I and that's so that's being summed up over I. We're also going to have the summation over K of all thermal energy entering or leaving the system where um, energy entering the system is positive here and it's going to be entering at temperature K so thermal energy Q dot K at temperature TK so here you can notice there's a car there's a basically a 1 minus T naught over T there's a Car Carnot efficiency associated with thermal energy meaning if the temperature of the energy leaving the system is the temperature of the environment, then there is no exergy leaving the system. If the temperature of the energy entering the system is infinity, then all that temperature, all that thermal energy counts as exergy. Okay, and then we have a minus uh, exergy leaving in the form of work. We also have a P naught times the change in the volume with respect to time. And then we have a very, very important term here, minus T naught times sigma dot irreversible. So we could have a decrease in the exergy in a control volume with respect to time when there is irreversibility within the system. So sigma dot irreversible, as we uh, noticed in prior lecture, is the, the rate of irreversible entropy generation within a control volume. And what that does is it, that uh, is a measure of how much exergy is being destroyed. 
So t naught. So when you multiply the two, t naught times sigma dot ir irreversible, sigma dot irreversible. That is the exergy destruction. The other terms are basically showing where exergy is flowing into or out of the system. That last term is actually measuring the exergy, exergy destruction. So for a steady state system, what we're going to have is we're going to have the d by dt terms going to zero. And what we're left with when we rearrange terms here is that the, the amount of work, here I'm kind of um, assuming there's no mechanical work, so we're just saying all the work leaves is electrical work. So the electrical work is equal to the exergy flowing in minus the exergy leaving plus the exergy and thermal energy entering minus the exergy of thermal energy leaving minus the exergy destruction. Where exergy destruction, as I said before, was T naught times sigma naught irreversible. And that is the exergy balance equation for a steady state system, which was solved for by taking the first law minus T naught times the second law and then assuming steady state. So now we're going to um, take a couple of examples in which we apply the exergy balance equation just to see how it could be used in different situations. So in the first case, we're going to take the control volume to be the Earth itself. We're going to draw a box around the Earth, and we're going to say um, that's inside the Earth is the control volume. So we're going to use the exergy balance equation. And in this case, what we have is thermal energy entering, and we have thermal energy leaving the Earth. It's entering in the form of high energy uh, visible and UV radiation photons. So there's a Q dot term um, at a temperature of 6,000 Kelvin. And then the, the, um, that energy leaves at about 300 Kelvin. And um, so we have two terms here. We have no work. No work leaves the system and we have no flow of material in or out of the Earth's system. So what we're left with is that the summation of those Q dots when multiplied by the Carnot efficiency is equal to the extra destruction. So uh, what I have here is that graph that I used earlier from uh, Stanford, a group at Stanford University. And um, what I'm trying to point, point out is that you could calculate the extra destruction just by looking at the flow of thermal energy in and out and that would tell you the overall XUD destruction. Right. Now you could also sum up all the individual XUD destructions and the two terms should be exactly the same. So in their graph all the XUD destruction is those triangles with the lines through the triangle. And when you sum up all, that's where the XUD destruction is occurring. And um, when you sum all those up, that is the total exergy destruction, which is basically the exergy destroyed as UV and visible light is turned into infrared radiation. And going once again to that analogy they used with the coins, you can think of the, um, the UV and visible energy that comes into the Earth as like silver dollars, and we're basically turning it um, as it leaves in the form of um, infrared radiation, it's like turning it into nickels and, um, and pennies. And so the number of photons increases, but the energy per photon decreases. We could also use the exergy balance equation to look at a Carnot cycle. Carnot cycle is when um, temperature is added into a system at temperature T hot and it's removed from the system at T cold. And um, so it's added between states A and B and then taken away at states C and D and then in between in states B and C um, are isothermal compression or expansion. And in such a system um, we have no, we assume no um, irreversibility, that you do it really, 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 really slowly 
so that at no point in time do any silver dollars get converted into nickels or quarters or anything like that. And the only way you can have that happen is if you do it really, 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 really slowly in such that there's any temperature is exchanged um, to something else at, at a temperature very, 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 very close. And, um, when there is very little temperature gradient between things, you can only have thermal energy transferred very, 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 very slowly. So that's what I mean by that. Um, and when you do this, um, no silver dollars are converted into quarters or nickels or dimes or anything like that. So the work you get out of the system is all the extra G you put in minus the extra G that leaves. Right, so it's the Carnot efficiency times the Q's. And from that, you can calculate how much work. Um, so using the extra G balance equation, it's actually a very, very, very simple way of calculating how much work can be, calcul um, can be um, obtained from the system. Okay. Uh, the next one we'll look at is a little bit more complicated, but it's much more like what we'll be doing in this class. So here we have a um, putting a control volume around entire gas turbine. So that's a compressor, combustor, and, and expander. So we're going to have inputs into the system such as air and fuel, and we're going to have uh, outputs such as the hot exhaust, and we're going to have some electricity. Uh, but we're going to be assuming here that it's there's no Q dot term. Um, or if you do have a Q dot, you could, the Q dot term here could go away. We're going to assume steady state, so the um, D, D, E, D, T term drop out, drops out. And um, what you have in this case is that the amount of work is equal to the extra G flowing in minus the extra G of leaving the system in the exhaust air. And then if there were a Q dot term, that would show up. And then we have a minus T naught times sigma dot irreversible. So there is going to be, because you're doing this in a finite amount of time, um, you're going to have irreversibility. And that's because due to friction. You've got turbulence. You've got eddies forming around all these mechanical parts. You've got temperature gradients where heat can flow across temperature gradients. You've got all sorts of um, locations where there's irreversibility. Basically, locations, anytime you have friction or eddies, silver dollars are being converted into nickels and dimes. Right? The only time they're not are when you do things really, really, really slow so that there's virtually no flow and it's still very, very laminar with non-friction laminar. If you have non-friction laminar flow, you can get close to doing things um, reversibly, but anytime you start getting eddies and temperature gradients, and obviously you got some r some major temperature gradients because that combustion region can be um, up to 1600 Kelvin, and outside in the environment it's 300 Kelvin. So there's always some very large temperature uh, differences, and that because of all these things, you're not going to be getting. 100% um, of the extra G that flows in in the form of work. Right. So this equation can be used to estimate how much actual work you get. So once again, um, what I want to point out here, these are the numbers that I've, um, um, in a previous slide, we discussed all the C -C P's and betas and delta H's and delta S's and the van der Waal corrections A prime and B prime. I want to point out here is that so in the the definition of the flow exergy, you needed to know what the partial pressure was of a gas species in the environment. Now, for most gases, this is a fairly simple thing. Um, <coughs> let's say for nitrogen and oxygen, it's just their composition in the environment, and that's the same for water vapor and carbon dioxide. So nitrogen here is going to be 0.8. You can use 0.78. You can use 0.79. It's not going to have an effect on your calculations. And the same for oxygen. You can use 0 0.2, 0 0.21. Not going to have a large effect. Water vapor, um, its composition is about 
um, 2% in the atmosphere. It's going to vary, as I said before, but it won't have a large effect because, remember, it's showing up in a logarithm um, of a term. Carbon dioxide being 400 parts per million, or 4 times 10 to the minus 4th of an atmosphere. Now, the interesting ones here are going to be hydrogen, carbon monoxide, and methane. They're the partial pressure that you need to use in the equation I gave in the denominator of the P over P term. For hydrogen, it's 10 to the minus 41. For carbon monoxide, it's 10 to the minus 48. And for methane, it's about 3 times 10 to the minus 46. These are really, really, really small numbers, and especially, you know, for this methane one, but even for the other ones, it's smaller than is actually could ever be achieved. The, the point here is that those are the partial pressures that you would solve for using the standard enthalpies and the standard entropies of combustion. Meaning you could solve for those partial, what the partial pressure sh should be of methane next to a really, really good platinum catalyst. All right. If, if you had um, a platinum catalyst and you, you're surrounded by oxygen, uh, there should only be like 3 times 10 to the minus 46 of an atmosphere or partial pressure of methane. In the real atmosphere, the composition is much higher than that because we're not surrounded by platinum and the methane can sit around there for a while before it gets turned into carbon dioxide and water vapor. Um, but the point here is in the equations what you should be when you're calculating the extra G you should be using for methane 3 times um, 10 to the uh, to the minus 146 and um, in the next set of slides we'll, we'll, we'll talk about how we actually calculate it um, but just for now um, I want to point out that you can calculate it by looking at, at the um, using the delta A H and delta S's that I've given here, along with the partial pressure of water vapor, carbon dioxide, and oxygen in the environment.